In today's last video, I wanted to take a look at one more step that can quench cations, and that's this idea of the 1-2 rearrangement. We saw this last time in some detail, but I really wanted to go really into detail this time about the orbitals involved and some other considerations of the 1-2-R step, when it's reasonable, etc. So they're also known as Wagner-Mirwein or Wagner-Mirwein shifts. You may hear this in your own organic chemistry class, but what happens in these 1-2 rearrangements, or these carbocation rearrangements, is an alkyl group that is sp3 hybridized or a hydrogen shifts over one carbon towards a positive charge. Here's an example employing a hydrogen. You can also imagine groups like methyl, ethyl, butyl, etc., alkyl groups being located where that hydrogen is located. We draw the curved arrow such that the bond migrates towards the positive charge, and that leads to a new bond where the cation was, and a cation that's left behind on the carbon that no longer contains that bond, or no longer is part of that bond. So what you see in the product here is, notice that the bond has migrated to the right, and the cation that's left behind is on the carbon where the bond originally was, that CH bond originally was. Now, the speed, the relative speed of these rearrangements is very important, because many times you have a choice between moving a hydrogen or moving an alkyl group. Hydrogens tend to move faster than alkyl groups because they're smaller, but another thing to consider is that you want to form a more stable cation. We'll talk about this in more detail in a little bit, but the fact that you want to form a more stable cation dictates that you should almost always move an H when you have the opportunity to do so. Remember that greater substitution stabilizes cations. As a result, moving an H tends to increase the substitution of a cation if it can be increased. As a result, you're almost always going to want to, to move H over alkyl, given the choice. Now, orbital-wise, this is a sigma to A pi-type interaction. The sigma bond that's interacting here is the carbon-hydrogen bond. The empty A that's receiving the electrons is on the cation itself, and it's pi-type because it's an intramolecular overlap. So, just like we saw, in fact, for the DE step, with the slight difference that the sigma bond is migrating rather than breaking completely. So very subtle difference between DE and this step, but the products are very different. We lack a uh, pi bond in the product of this step, whereas we had a pi bond in the product of DE. The favorability of 1-2-R steps is very important to think about. And 1-2-Rs are favored only when more stable cations form. The classical example on the last slide, in fact, is a classic example of a 1-2-R that is favored because a more stable, more substituted cation is formed. So notice, let's see, on my right, we have a secondary cation, whereas on my left, the product of the rearrangement is a more stable tertiary cation. When you see this, you know that a 1-2 rearrangement is reasonable, and you should think about it as a mechanistic possibility. That's sort of the classical example, but more interesting examples, I think, come from the development of resonance in the product of a 1-2-R. So what you see over here is a carbocation, one carbon separated from a nitrogen atom. If we could move over one of the bonds from that carbon that's bridging the cationic carbon and the nitrogen, well, then we would shift the positive charge over towards this carbon right here, right? And so that would lead to a resonance-stabilized intermediate. Don't forget that that nitrogen possesses a lone pair that it can use to stabilize the resulting cation. So the nitrogen's lone pairs can donate in, and we actually see that in the resonance structures here on the right-hand side of the slide. We see how the development of a double bond or a pi bond between the carbon and nitrogen leads to stabilization of that cation. And so the product in this case is a lot more stable than the starting materials due to that delocalization. Now let's take a deeper look at the orbital picture for this reaction. So once again, it's similar to the DE step. However, the difference is that the bond is migrating rather than breaking entirely. So once again, we have a carbocation typically with 
an empty p orbital. Doesn't have to be an empty p orbital, could be a hybrid. Adjacent to the carbo cation is a sigma bond, and that sigma bond needs to be parallel to the empty p orbital. That parallel overlap is ideal for donation of the sigma bond into the empty A. So this is the kind of orbital picture and again the reactive confirmation that you should think about in the context of the 1-2-R step. So just to review what we've talked about today, we looked at cation quenching steps, the elementary steps that donate electrons into cations, and these include the DE step, the AN step, and the 1-2-R step. AN is the nucleophilic association of a lone pair with an empty A orbital on a cation. DE is similar, but involves the association of a sigma bond and the formation of a pi bond through that association, and usually a group called an electrofuge, which is just like a nucleophuge, except it leaves without taking electrons with it, breaks off from the molecule and goes away, and most commonly that's going to be H+. And finally, we looked at the 1-2-R step, which is a step that moves a sigma bond onto a cation, leaving a ca another cation somewhere else. This moves a cation, but has the effect of stabilizing it either through extra substitution or resonance delocalization, leading to oftentimes some unpredictable pathways as a result of these 1-2-R steps. So next time we're going to take a look in more detail at steps that involve pi bonds. These are very, very common. The carbonyl group, which is a pi bond between carbon and oxygen, is one of the most common functional groups in all of organic chemistry. The ADN and E-beta steps, which we'll look at in more detail next time, are going to be very important in the chemistry of carbonyls. We'll also take a look up in a little more detail at the AE step, which is, I believe, right, whoop, right here. The AE step, which we saw very shortly in the context of the Prinz reaction, and that's essentially a double bond acting as a nucleophile. So we'll look at those steps in more detail next time. Thanks for joining me today, and I'll see you next time.